Chapter 22, The Emerald Stadium of Oz. The entry for the Emerald City in Travels into Several Remote Regions of Ever After in Four Parts by Lemuel Gulliver devotes an entire page to Emerald Stadium, the crown jewel in a city built out of crown jewels. The grandstands and dugouts were carved out of shimmering emerald crystals that rose so high into the sky that the place felt more like a fairy castle than a baseball stadium. Green pennants hung from every roof, and a great green clock in center field ticked away the time. The infield was outlined with foul lines made of real diamonds, and the green grass of the field was so emerald it was hard to tell where the outfield ended and where the wall began. A sellout crowd cheered as the emerald jumbotron in right center came to life with bursts of flame around it. An enormous bald head, bigger than any giant's, took in the crowd with its big round eyes. I am Oz, the great and terrible, he thundered, welcomed one and all to the final game of the annual Ever After Baseball Tournament. Two teams have survived this fantastic test of skill and determination, the Grim Reapers and our very own Oz Cyclones. The audience roared, and for the first time, Alex realized just what an accomplishment that was. He and Dorothy shared a nod. They had come this far together. Now they would finish it. As you know, the wizard went on, the winning team will be granted wishes by the great and terrible Oz. One wish for each player, whatever they want, their heart's desires. Alex turned to look at his friends on the bench. What would each of them wish for if they won? Would they just use their wishes not to be forgotten or for something else? Scraps, Toad, TikTok, Br'er Rabbit, Jack, the little hedgehog in an apron, and a white dress who is knitting at the end of the bench. Wait, who? Dorothy, who's that? Oh, um, that's Mrs. Tiggly, Tiggy Wink. Tiggy Winkle. She's an old friend. But what's she doing here? Dorothy wouldn't look at him. I um, I added her to the roster before the game, just in case, you know, we need a, a pinch hitter late in the game. Alex understood. You mean in case I disappear? Dorothy looked heartbroken. Please don't be upset, Alex. I'm sure you're not going to disappear. It's just after what happened on the bus yesterday. It's all right. If I don't make it, it's important that the rest of you do, he told her. Dorothy still looked sick about it, but she nodded her thanks. And now, without any further humbug, the wizard announced, let the game begin. Emerald cannons shot Greek, Greek confetti into the stands. The National Orchestra of Oz played a warbling anthem, and Mighty Casey, a handlebar mustachio ball player, in an old-timey uniform, threw out the ceremonial first pitch. What is it with Ever After in baseball, Alex asked Scrapped. Why is everybody here so crazy for it? Are you kidding, she asked. Wait till next year has to be the biggest dream of all time. Dorothy and Alex took the lineup cards to the umpires, who were immediately familiar. They were the three magicians who had captured the Big Bad Wolf the day Alex had arrived and Ever After. He guessed they were there not only to umpire, but to keep watch over the Reaper's newest member, who came to home plate with Long John Silver to bring their lineup card. Hello, everyone, said Charles Wallace. Merlin, the fairy godmother, and I will be your umpires today. Merlin and the fairy godmother never took their eyes off the Big Bad Wolf, who now wore the black and red uniform of the Reapers. His hair didn't look charred, which meant he probably died in the fire and come back. Alex couldn't help but smile at the thought, even though it had probably just made the wolf matter. We just have a few items to go over and we'll get started, Charles Wallace said. We flipped a coin and the Cyclones will bat first. Reapers, that means you're the home team and will bat last. Also, per tournament rules, there is to be no magic used by any of the players. Natural abilities are, of course, allowed, but the three of us are attuned to magic and wizardry of every kind and will be keeping careful watch. Understood? And finally, the players in today's games are here at the discretion of the Wizard of Oz. He looked pointedly at the Big Bad Wolf. Anyone who threatens or attacks anyone will be removed by force if necessary. The wolf put up a solemn paw. Promise is a promise. He's lying, Dorothy told them. We saw him eat Pinocchio only two days ago in the forest of fighting trees. Have thee any proof, Marilyn asked. Well, for one thing, Pinocchio's not around anymore, Alex said. Pinocchio has been known to disappear in the wild woods for days and weeks at a time, the big bed wolf argued. Who's to say he's not there right now? The fairy godmother's wings fluttered anxiously. I'm afraid we can only concern ourselves with here and now, dears. And now it is time for the game to begin, Charles Wallace said. May the best team win.
Hey, we intend to, said Long John. Care to make a wager on that, Dorothy asked. The wolf smiled. Don't you think you've learned your lesson, little girl? Her ruby and silver cleats glittered on his feet. What's wrong, wolf? Chicken? Beside the wolf, Long John Silver growled. Where I come from, Lassie, to question a man's courage is to ask for pistols at 30 paces. Yeah, Alex said. Where I come from, you're a fast food chain. You lose. I get my cleats back, Dorothy told the wolf. And what do you have that I could possibly want, the wolf asked. Dorothy didn't have an answer to that question. Me, Alex said. If we lose, I'll let you eat me without a fight. Alex, no. Deal, the wolf said quickly. And with a worried frown, a flick of her wand, the fairy godmother magically bounced them to their word, or bound them to their word. Now, as I believe they say in athletic contests of this kind, Charles Wallace said, play ball. The world... The words were magically broadcast throughout the stadium, and a shout went up from the eager fans. On the way back to the dugout, Alex was tingling, and for the first time in days, it had nothing to do with the itch. You shouldn't have done that, Dorothy told him. Doesn't matter, he said. We're going to win, right? He smiled. You got to believe. All right, Dorothy said when they got to the dugout. Pinkerton, you're up first. Toad, grab a bat. And where's Toad? That's what I'd like to know, said a policeman coming out of the dugout tunnel. He wore a blue uniform and sunglasses and a patch on his sleeve, said Sheriff of Nottingham. He clicked a ballpoint pen and held it over his notebook. He's not in the clubhouse and he's not in the dugout. Tell me, when was the last time you saw the suspect? The suspect, Alex asked, what's the charge? 47 counts of grand theft auto and 116 counts of reckless endangerment. We got a tip from the other team that he'd be out here today. Of course you did, Dorothy muttered. Alex did a double take when he saw Scraps had four legs sticking out of her skirt, two of which had webbed feet. Alex gave Dorothy a nudge to let her know where Toad was hiding, and she edged the other direction so that the sheriff kept his back to Scraps. I we saw him this morning, but then he took off, Dorothy lied. Yes, he bought a motor car and hit the open road, Alex added. Told us he wasn't coming back, off to see the world and all that. The sheriff flipped his notebook closed and gave Alex his card. All right, I'll check with the local record services and hospitals, but I'm leaving some officers here in the stadium to keep a lookout. You'll let me know if you see him? Er, yes, of course. Toad, Dorothy whispered when the sheriff was gone. Toad, what are we going to do? The game has started. Oh, hapless Toad, he moaned. Oh, ill-fated animal. Someone phone my solicitor. The jig is up. It'll be the ball and chain for me forever. I'm caught dead to rights. He will be if he takes the field, said Scraps. What else can we do, Jack asked. We can play Mrs. Tiggy Winkle instead, Alex told them. No offense, Dorothy told the old hedgehog, but she's no toad. Alex, no, Alex said, borrowing Mrs. Tiggy Winkle's bonnet and putting it on Toad's head. What if we play Mrs. Tiggy Winkle there instead? You mean dress me up as a washerwoman, Toad cried but it'll ruin my chances for election. I was going to parlay my dazzling on-field leadership skills and our ensuing victory into the, an election day win. The crowd cheered as Pinkerton doubled to right center. Toad, you're up next. It's now or never. Toad's lips quivered. Toad's lip quivered. Anything for the team, he said sadly. That's my motto. But Alex Dorothy asked while Toad made his quick change. If Mrs. Tiggy Winkle is at short... And or we can't very well run the real Mrs. Tiggy Winkle out there later in the game. What if I'm not going anywhere, Alex assured her. Not yet. I feel good. Better than I have in days. Seriously. The problem of the toad was solved for the moment, but the Reapers had even more tricks up their back sleeves. In the second inning, Br'er Rabbit went out to his position at third, only to find another identical Br'er Rabbit already there. The doppelganger turned out to be a tar version of Br'er Rabbit who got himself stuck when he picked a fight with it. In the third, a huff and puff from the Big Bad Wolf sent Pinkerton flying off course in the outfield. And in the fifth inning, the horned king of Anwen accidentally smashed Jack Pumpkin, Jack's pumpkin head by sliding hard into second antlers first. Dorothy and Scraps had to chase Jack's body around until they could drag it back to the dugout. And it took an inning and a half to find a replacement pumpkin. But Alex was the cyclone's biggest problem. He kept telling everyone he was fine but he was fading in and out more and more and missing throws that sailed right through his open glove. Between his errors and the Reaper's tricks, the Cyclones were falling apart. By the end of the seventh inning, the Reapers led 7-2. We're going to lose, Dorothy said, sitting next to Alex on the bench. 
She punched a knife into the pumpkin she found to replace Jack's head and angrily, angrily sliced away at the line for his jagged mouth. After everything we've done, after coming all of this way, we're finished. It's just their pranks, Alex told her. If this was a fair game, we could beat the pants off them. So how do we level the playing field? Jack asked, startling Alex. Jack's head had come back to life as soon as Dorothy finished cutting out his mouth, and Alex wondered again how everyone and ever after could take all this weirdness in stride. But that was it, wasn't it? That was how the Reapers were beating them. They knew everything about his teammates, their strengths, their weaknesses, their obsessions. They could read the Cyclones like, well, like an open book. I know how we do it, Alex told them. We have to beat them at their own game. How, Dorothy asked. First, Alex said, I need you to tell me some stories.